Today's video is a little grab bag of concepts. We're going to begin with the major triads that we introduced in the previous video. So if you haven't watched episode 8 yet, it might help you make a little more sense of today's episode if you watch that one first. From there, we'll turn to the concept of musical form, and we'll examine the way we organize musical statements into larger groupings and structures. And then after the break, we'll end the unit like we always have, by studying a new set of musical markings and Italian terms. This time, they're all about repeat signs and the roadmap to reading your sheet music. Let's not waste any more time in the intro, just grab your textbook and get comfortable, and let's get into the good stuff. Let's begin today by revisiting a concept from the previous video. Back then, we introduced the idea of three-note harmonies, and we named them triads. And although there are a few different types of triads, we limited ourselves to studying only one type, the major triad. When it comes to constructing a major triad, we learned about the scale method. In this method, if we have to build a major triad from a given note, we actually begin by drawing the major scale from that given note. So if we're asked to build a D major triad, then we'll begin by drawing the D major scale. From there, we simply take the pitches Do, Mi, and Sol from the scale we've just laid out, and we combine them to create a major triad. It sounds like this. Now, the great news about the scale method is that as long as you're familiar with your scales and key signatures, this can be a pretty fast way to build major triads. The bad news is that the scale method only works for major triads. And pretty soon, we're going to be building other types of triads that the scale method won't help us with. To get ready for that, we're going to take a second look at major triads in today's video so that I can show you another way to build them. And from here on out, I'll refer to this as the snowman method. Now let's use the D major triad again to demonstrate. Step one, draw the root note of your triad. Triads are always named after their root note so if you're asked to build a D major triad, you know the root note is D natural. If your root note includes a sharp or a flat, such as F sharp or E flat, be sure to include that accidental when drawing the root note on the staff. Step two, draw notes a third and a fifth above the root note without worrying about whether they should be sharp, flat, or natural. At this point, our only goal is to create the basic outline of a triad by stacking thirds above our root note like this. If the root note occupies a line on the staff, so will the third and the fifth on the two lines just above the root. And if the root note occupies a space on the staff, then the third and the fifth will also be drawn on spaces, again, just above the root. Now, step two is also where the snowman moniker comes from. If you imagine the root note as the base of your snowman, then stacking the remaining two notes of the triad will complete this image of a little snowman on your staff paper. If your snowman looks a little out of shape, either squished too short or stretched too tall, then double check your work before going on. It's totally possible that you've outlined the triad incorrectly. Step three, add accidentals to the third and the fifth as necessary so that you end up with the correct intervals in the end. Now, step one and step two are pretty straightforward, but we do need to unpack this third step a little bit. The first thing to recall is that while triads are made up of three notes, 
it's not so much which three notes are used, but rather the intervals formed between those three notes that end up determining how a triad will sound. All major triads, regardless of which root note the triad is built upon, follow the same formula. Which is to say, every major triad contains some pitch for its root note, another pitch a major third above that root note, and a final pitch a minor third above that. Coming back to step three then, in order to fine tune our snowman so that it sounds like a proper major third, we need to create this major third and minor third from our recipe. And it's as simple as counting half steps from one note to the next. Remember, there are four half steps in a major third, and there are three half steps in a minor third. So beginning from our root note of D natural, we first need to create a major third. So use a piano keyboard to count up four half steps from D natural. What note did you land on? Is it the same note that we've already drawn in step two, or do we need to add an accidental? Well, in this case, it is a different note, and we need to add an accidental to make this F sharp rather than F natural. Now, continuing on from F sharp, we use the keyboard to count up three half steps to build a minor third. And this time, the note that we land on is the note we've already drawn in step two. A natural. So we don't need to add any accidentals here. You can step back now and proudly look upon your very own major triad built from the ground up. Now, the important thing to remember about step three is that we aren't moving notes around on the staff. We've already stacked thirds by building the snowman in step two, so we only need to add sharps or flats to make these thirds major or minor. In the next video, we're going to learn the other recipes for the remaining types of triads, but each and every one of them can be built using the snowman method. With that in mind, I encourage you to get a jump on things by building a few major triads for practice, using the snowman method to build your triad, and maybe using the scale method to check your work. When we study music through the lens of music theory, it's easy sometimes to lose sight of how all these different ideas come together. So that's why I get so excited about teaching musical form. Form refers to the melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic relationships between the musical units of a composition. Formal analysis, therefore, is the way we uncover, elucidate, and find meaning in these formal relationships. In music, there are endless formal possibilities, and throughout this course, we'll study just a few of the most common to our repertoire. But as limitless as the possibilities are, there are also some commonalities among the ways that we group musical statements across genres and across time periods. We're going to start our discussion of form with a look at two of these fundamental structures. Motives in music are short recurring figures marked by a signature pattern, which are identifiable throughout a section of music. The signature pattern of a motive might be harmonic, melodic, or rhythmic, or some combination of all three. One of the most iconic motives in Western music is the opening of Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 in C minor. This motive combines signature rhythmic and melodic elements to form an identifiable pattern that will continue to reappear throughout the entire symphony. Motives are also generally considered to be the smallest subdivision of a musical statement that still maintains its thematic identity. Think of the opening of Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim. When Cinderella sings, 
I wish on a rising major second. Although it's only two notes separated by only a whole step, this little motive will become the basis for a whole bunch of what's to come. But try to break this motive down into something even smaller, and it's hard to argue that you have any discernible motive left. Phrases are a higher level of organizing musical statements, and while motives are usually short musical fragments, phrases are typically more substantial. Musical phrases express an idea or a statement by taking us from one tonal point to another, while giving us the sense of being a self-sufficient musical unit. Phrases may end with a feeling of conclusion, or they may also end with a sense of surprise, suspension, or continuation. But in each case, the phrase is able to more or less stand alone as a complete musical idea. If we were studying languages instead of music, this is where we would be talking about clauses and sentences. As listeners, we rely on phrases and phrase structure to help interpret and organize the sounds we are hearing. As performers, it can sometimes be quite ambiguous or unclear how to delineate the phrases in a piece. And as singers, we usually have the added challenge of dealing with the intersection of language and music, not to mention needing to breathe from time to time. With time and practice, you will come to develop a sense of phrasing that feels both intuitive and artistic. But it all begins by learning to recognize these smaller units of formal structure. With that, let's take a short intermission before switching gears. Go ahead and hit pause in the next screen to stretch your legs, drink some water, and eat some orange slices, and then we've got more knowledge for you after the break. On the B side of today's video, we're going to strengthen our musical literacy by studying the roadmap to reading music. These are a set of musical markings and Italian terms that help music copyists and publishers save paper, ink, and time. Some songs are simple and straightforward. You start at the beginning and then sing straight through until the final bar line. But if a song has passages of music that are repeated verbatim, then we can use special bar lines called repeat signs to repeat that section. A forward repeat sign indicates the beginning of a repeated section, and a backward repeat sign marks the end of the repeated section. A composer may indicate how many times to repeat a section by simply marking three times, four times, etc. If there is no indication, it's generally understood that we repeat the passage only twice and then continue on after the second time. In musical theater, it's also common to find repeated passages that are marked vamp or safety. And that just tells us to continue repeating the passage again and again until the cue to continue. These vamps or safeties are commonly used to accommodate musical passages that underscore dialogue or stage action that are variable in length. We also encounter passages of music that are nearly identical, but they differ somehow in the very last few measures of the section. A common example is a verse that's followed by another verse as compared to a verse that leads into a bridge or a chorus. The first 80% of the verse might be identical, but that last 20% that changes makes a simple repeat sign impossible. For this situation, we use endings marked by numbered brackets, as well as our forward and backward repeat signs. Now here, the performer reads through the music as usual, 
until they reach the backward repeat sign under the first ending. This sends us back to the forward repeat sign at the beginning of the passage to sing again. Now once again, the performer is going to read through the music for a second time now, until they arrive at that first ending. At this point, they're going to skip over the music in the first ending and go straight to the second ending. Now there's one more type of repeat sign that you might encounter, though it's more prevalent in instrumental parts, such as piano and drums. This is the one bar repeat, and it's used to indicate a measure that repeats the previous measure exactly, and then it goes on. Now, unlike the repeat signs from earlier, this one bar repeat still takes up two measures on the page. However, it does save us from needing to write out the notes in the repeated measure a second time, which is quite handy if you're writing out something repetitive, like a drum set part. There's another side to the musical roadmap as well, and this side uses Italian terms to tell us where to go in the music, just like we used Italian terms to describe tempos, articulations, and dynamics earlier. There are just six terms for us to learn, and then we can mix and match them however the music requires. First up, we have da and ah, or dal and all, which respectively mean from the and to the, as in go from the beginning to the end. Simple enough, right? Next, we have capo and fine, which mean beginning and end. In Italian, capo literally means head, but here it might better translate as the top. Therefore, if a composer wishes at some point in the music to go from the beginning to the end, they would usually write da capo al fine. And oftentimes, da capo will be abbreviated to dc, but it means the same thing. Now, finally, the terms segno and coda are used to indicate points in the music other than the very beginning or the very end. Segno in Italian means sign, and it refers to this musical marking. Let's imagine that the composer wants us to go back and repeat a previous passage, but it's in the middle of the piece somewhere, so we can't use da capo. Instead, the composer will place a segno over the measure we're meant to return to, and when it comes time to jump back to that point, the composer just has to write dal segno, or ds, meaning from the sign. Coda, on the other hand, describes a concluding passage of music, which will appear as a semi-detached passage at the end of the main musical structure, and it's identified by this marking. Let's imagine that our music says dies al coda, or dal segno al coda. That marking instructs the performer to go back to the sign and then read the music from there until arriving at the marking al coda. At that point, the performer just has to skip ahead all the way to the coda and then continues reading until the final bar line. So there you go. Only six Italian terms today. And they basically all tell us to go back to here, either da capo or dal segno, and then go to there, either al fine or al coda. Don't be thrown if you see them mixed and matched. Da capo al fine, da capo al coda, dal segno al fine, dal segno al coda, and then our abbreviations DC and DS. All of these are perfectly acceptable and equally likely to appear in your music. That's going to bring us to a close on episode 9, as well as wrap up the third unit in our text, Music Fundamentals for Musical Theater. If you're following along in the book, this video coincides with the review of chapters 9 to 12. 
Today, we've recapped major triads once again and introduced the snowman method of constructing them. We followed that up with a discussion of motives and phrases, the first two building blocks of musical form. And then on the second half, we learned all about the musical markings in Italian terms that are used to indicate repeats and jumps in our written music. Next time, we're going to expand our work with triads even further to include three other types, as well as introduce a whole bunch of new solfege syllables and a brand new time signature to boot. Until next time, be kind to each other, and thanks for watching.